This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, Mark is an associate member of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, is a transplant to the Boston area from Colorado, uh, where he works as a cybersecurity professional. Uh, he is passionate about his family, art medals, and rare succulents. Uh, having met through a mutual admiration of Victor uh, Brenner and Abraham Lincoln, uh, he collaborated with Dick Johnson uh, on several medallic projects, including works of medallic art attributed to Don Eberhardt, Joel Iskovitz, Hugo Greco, and Luigi Badia. Uh, he indulges in travel for research and collecting and is looking forward to, quote unquote, more fluid research access once uh, coronavirus is merely an, an endemic. And aren't we all looking forward to that? So please uh, uh, welcome me. Uh, let me introduce uh, Mark Slaforce. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, is, is that sound okay? All right. So today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, one of the things that had happened is that Jesse had invited me to come speak. I had submitted um, a topic. Uh, it's a topic I've been working on for a long time. As a matter of fact, it was one thing I think I, I thought I could contribute to the Brenner uh, catalog resume. Uh, and the, then the pandemic hit. And a lot of my research leads that I've been developing over the years were suddenly silent, or they couldn't get access to the research materials. I had a uh, National Archives researcher assigned to me. We just started working. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to make as much progress. I'm sorry? I wasn't able to make as much progress as I wanted. Um, so Jesse, so I called Jesse and I told him I was going to withdraw. And Jesse told me, no, you're not going to. We need you there. Uh, I'm going to give you an assignment. And so he and Scott spent a lot of time scanning in some documents. Um, which I used uh, to help me. And they were basically unpublished, uncatalogued documents in the, the archives. What did I just do? Am I doing something wrong? Yes, I'm doing something wrong. Oh, OK. Um, but before we get started, <clears throat> well, let me finish. So uh, Jesse gave me the assignment. I started getting into it a little bit, and then suddenly it dawned on me that actually I didn't have to necessarily come up with the original research. I'd done some of that, but actually there's a lot of stories to tell that I can share with you that I think would, will help us build what I'm going to call sort of a Brenner community. But before I get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about Dick Johnson. Dick Johnson passed away last December. Um, it was a very special place in my heart for Dick. I don't want to talk about him a lot because I'm going to cry and I don't want to do that on video. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he's the one that was a gate, my gateway to Victor Brenner. I had contacted him many years ago. I had read about his data bank, his famous data bank. I'm sure everyone's read about his data bank. And he claimed to have a, a, a better um, catalog of Brenner's medals than Smedley did, um, but he wouldn't share it with me at first. And so we developed a friendship. And then when I saw the extent of it, when he started sharing it with me and to develop a catalog resume seemed like a, a long, long project. Um, and so we sort of put that aside and started working on some others while we continued to work on it. So I wouldn't be here today without Dick. Um, my topic has, I'd say my presentation has changed twice since I've been here. One of the reasons why we had the technical delay is I brought the wrong file from the hotel. Um, the first day was incredible for me. And it seems like we have a chance to build on something here. Um, Jesse being here um, has been a, a way of gateway of me sort of in integrating or connecting with the ANS. I appreciate that. Um, 
a lot of special thanks here to the people that helped me at the last minute because basically in the last week I've created three different presentations. This is my best one of them. Um, I also want to thank the American Numismatic Society, the Resolute Americana Collection, and the Stack family because this would not have happened. And if Ariel Brenner's on the line, oh shoot. Anyway, that's an inside joke to PS for Ariel. So I've organized my presentation into chapters. There are six chapters. The first is the class. So this is from the AMS archives. This is part of the assignment that Jesse gave me. Jesse, I did not complete my assignment. I chose to do other things instead. But it actually gave me my first chapter because it's a nice introduction into the community of Brenner. Um, so they've, they continue to discover, Jesse and uh, Scott continue to discover all these documents, unpublished, uncatalogued in the archives. It must be delightful to do that. I know what happens when I find something no one's ever seen before. Uh, they found 100 pages of documents related to Brenner. Taken as a whole, it suggests that Dilbert was, could have been recognized uh, the ANS and Brenner sign. And I'm not trying to compare Rick, Victor Brenner to Dilbert, but only that the situation there was seemed a little chaotic when it came to the administrative. The other interesting, the, the, but the thing that I found fascinating, the, the thing I drew my story from, is the fact that there are a lot of private, I should say, they're internal memos, but they write like they write them like emails. And I'm, I was thinking about that. Back then, they were writing on carbon copy. If you made a mistake, you didn't start over, right? So it's not like today, where if I'm editing, if I'm emailing, I get a chance to edit. So I can send a very personal email and make sure it's perfect. So when I read these, I, I got to realize they know that they're committing this to long term storage. They know it's going to only have internal distribution, but they also know it's going to be a limited number of people that see it. So I, I think it gets a little more personal. So the class. So I got to thank Scott for this little tidbit. So Charles Pike. And David Brenner, Victor David Brenner gave a class on metal designing and die cutting. Um, he did this uh, for a period of just about seven months. Uh, he got a salary of $50 a month. He was given some advances to procure materials. I guess I didn't have a lot of materials. I don't really know. Scott tells me there's some companion documents related to Pike's expenses too. So I don't know if Brenner bought certain supplies and Pike bought others, but anyway, that's not important. What's important is he's given cash advances. Now think about it, give an artist cash advance, what's gonna happen? So the class materials, nothing unusual. I actually take a sculpting class in college. I recognize the bell Italian, but I think I know it as the woman of the song. Is anyone familiar with that? It's a it's the the background to that is it's theoretically um, cast from a woman that drowned in the sun. It's everywhere. I think it's pretty much, I think it's David Gare in pretty much any studio. Um, I don't know if these are the, the exact images or the exact objects he bought. They're similar to them. Um, the Discobolus, I'm sure everyone's seen. Um, it's interesting, there's a 25% discount. Maybe that was for the ANS. Maybe that was for Brander. I don't know. Um, what was interesting is the class book. So Brenner was given a cash advance of $25, and, but ultimately, of course, what he bought took some more money. As a matter of fact, he had to re be reimbursed twice. And that's what leads to this very interesting memo. I've, you probably can't read it here, but this is what uh, Langdon said about Brenner. Mr. Brenner has exceeded his appropriation without authority from me, but I suppose we must expect an artist, especially a good one, not to confine himself to the rules of business. Next chapter, the copyright. So this touches on some of this original research I've been trying to do, which is on the, the speculative efforts of Brenner with his Lincoln design. So he applied and was granted a copyright in late February of 1907. 
It was unusual speculative venture. I think everyone's been talking about this. That he doesn't, doesn't usually speculate because he doesn't really have the funds to invest in materials and the services. Um, but what's interesting to me is that less than a year after he had the copying, he was having the US Mint produce specifically these, these Uniface plaquettes. Um, within the next year, though, both S. Kleber and Gorm were making products based on the design. On August 2nd, I'm just trying to put together a timeline in your mind. I'm going to flesh out a little bit more. August 2nd, the Lincoln Center is released. August 5th, what was on Brenner's mind August 5th when he heard the news? They're stopping production, they're going to recut the dyes, and his initials are gone. This is the man who was in front of Director Leach, had the audacity to say, I want my full name on the back. I mean, he's not, this, this may be a clue into why Brenner's relationship is out, but whatever happened in the early teens, this may be a, a, a clue to what may have happened. I don't know. But what that meant is by the time these events start happening, there are actually three different production houses, and not overlapping, but during 1909, they make at least four different products based on his design. Oh, well, missing some images there and some text. I don't, that was a Uniface plaquette. It's nothing unusual. I just wanted to show you for dimensions. So um, I want to thank um, who gave me this. Oh, McMahon gave me this. I'm going to thank him very much for this because this was this is this is the little bit of data that finally turned my mind and made me decide to come here today. Because this was actually a little bit of a missing link for me. This is very important. So all in all, 440 of the Lincoln plaquettes were made, 150 of the centennial medals were made. But look at the dates. The 150 centennial medals were made in a very narrow time range. Right? It's only three months. So something happened, right? Because we know the Lincoln plaquettes were made before and after the centennial medals. So now it's the time to fill in some more. So I've already reviewed the beginning here, the beginning of this timeline. Let's flesh it in a little bit more. So design copyright comes out within a year. He's got the mint making and plaquettes. Uh, Kleber ads begin appearing in journals. So Kleber, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment, made a product uh, by Brenner. It's, Ubiquitous, there seven, seem to be a lot of them out there, seven and a half by nine inches. Uh, some of them mounted on marble, all of them have easel backs. And there's actually another lot smaller size. Uh, then on July 25th, 1908, Brenner was at Oyster Bay sitting with Roosevelt for the port, his portrait um, sketches for the Panama Canal Medal. And this is where I've had a lot of conversations with Burdett about this, which plaque, which, which design was shown, et cetera, et cetera, we've talked a lot about. He has his opinions, I have mine. And that's actually significant, and I realize the detail, but it's significant, especially for artists, I'll show you in a moment. Um, what was also interesting on January 5th, when, when Brenner's thinking, I'm, I'm gonna get this commission, I'm gonna get this commission, is sort of mine to lose. Um, he, there's a lot of conversations and a telegram, and it's just sort of confusing um, basically, Leach is concerned because Brenner has been passing out these centennial medals, right? So he's given Leach one, and Leach apparently somehow, somehow, Teddy Roosevelt got one. And I don't know if it was passed on through hands, but I can tell you right now, he didn't give it to him at Oyster Bay. There were no round designs, and I think there's something significant about in Brenner's mind, the difference between a round and a square design when it comes to copyright, because I can't figure this out. So there was, there was a conversation where Leach expressed some concern, sort of a conflict of interest. 
And actually, I have a lot of insight into that. And this is why this is an important story to me. I'll get to that in a moment. And Brenner says, oh, no, no, I've only made 110, only 35 had sold. You know, I'll cancel the order. But by this time, Brenner's made more than 110. And I think at this time, on January 5th, Brenner's already started working with Gorham. Because in February of 1909, Frank Higgins writes in the Numismatist about the, the, the article, Sculptor Brenner's Conception of Master Production for the Centenary Commemoration. And there's another article on the other side of the fold where someone's basically writing an article to make a pitch for Brenner doing the Lincoln Cent. So this seemed to be, there's been some collaboration going on. There's nothing going on. This is not. Unless there's a lot of coincidences, this is sort of weird. Uh, so the design gets accepted, the Lincoln Cent is released, and suddenly the initials have to come off. And in the middle of all this, Leach is left. There's a new director, Andrew, who's not very responsive or interested. What does Brenner say? He fesses up to work with Gorham. Why? He didn't tell Leach. I think Brenner's expecting the whole thing to collapse. That they're going to find out. Leach was concerned. They're going to find out about this. The whole thing's going to collapse. Why is it important? Which one? Well, I collaborated in 1911 with Joel Liskowitz on this. I mean, I can't take artistic credit. It's more subject and some of the design elements. But we traveled to Oyster Bay. We contacted the curator beforehand. He let us graciously come in on the day off. There was no visitors. He took down the velvet ropes. He said, as long as you step on the stuffed animal rugs, you can go anywhere you want, just don't touch anything. So we spent an hour and a half. This was very exciting for us. Joel got a lot of the, the pictures he wanted. This is, this is where Joel said, as an artist, Brenner would want this, this room in the Oyster Bay. Uh, this is right off the lobby. Um, I've got, I'm sorry, I'm tired. I don't remember her name. Teddy Roosevelt's wife had a sitting room on the other side of the hallway. It's a magnificent space. If you get a chance to go, it's, it's almost, it reminds me of going to Florence where everything is just decorated. It's like there's stuff everywhere. Now, there's a little license, uh, creative licensing here in the sense that um, the, 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 the view you see is elevated. Normally, if they were sitting, you would not see all the objects on the wall as, as high. Um, but we had to do that so we could, he had to do that so you could see the art above the heads. I won't go into all of the, the details here about what's significant. There, what is significant, though, is if you ignore in the, lotus, in the lower, lower left-hand corner, there's a plaquette. So at least to Joel Iskowitz, this is, it's really important which one it was. So let's talk a little about S. Claiborne Company. Um, John Kagan's talk yesterday was brought to light something that I really haven't spent a lot of time doing. When you're looking for answers to questions about motivations, especially back then, and you're dealing with a patronage world, you have to look at influence, right? So the big question was, which plaque or which Lincoln design of Brenner's did, Link, did Brenner show Teddy Roosevelt? And I, I, I'd say, I'm, I think it's one of the plaquettes from Claver. Or it could have been something that Victor did himself, but I think it was not in the round. I think it was easier to cast these things. So Claver Company, what's interesting about Claver is if you read the background here, I'm not going to read everything. There's too much details here. But think about Brenner's own family and Brenner's own path. Doesn't this sound vaguely reminiscent? He, he immigrated. He filed for citizenship. He got a job right away. He advanced. He made connections. He, I don't have this in here, but he started bringing his family over. Or do I? Oh, I forgot to put that. He started bringing his family over. And next thing you know, he's, he's working with the important artists and people of influence. I think 
Brenner collaborated with Clabber. I don't know if it was before or after he got the copyright, but I think somehow they knew each other beforehand. I'm guessing, yeah. but I don't know. Now, the other thing that's important is that the first ad for Clabber started, uh, Scott gave me this clue. Um, I've seen these ads everywhere. I just could never identify when I first started seeing, started seeing them. Scott found this advertisement at Architectural Record Digest for July. So we know as, as early as July, uh, Claber was trying to promote these, these products. Now, I found it interesting that there's no details on this. It just, the only ad says particulars on application. Were they fishing for ideas and just waiting for people to ask for things? I don't know, I don't know. I think this ad with the plaque appeared much later. That's, that's the plaque I was talking about that Claver made, it's cast. Um, what's famous about it, I think, is that it's believed that th this artwork came, I mean, Brenner had more control over the design materials for this than with Gorham, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, there's an edge mark on it, there's, that's, uh, that's my sample. Um, the edge marks on the lower left side. Uh, here's another photo from Dick Johnson archives. I don't know where that came from. Anyone know? Um, the Gorm Manufacturing Company was a very different organization than Claver. It was a megalith compared to Claver. Um, it became probably, it, late 1800s probably was the biggest producer of silversmithing in the world. And that is in part because they invested the technology and then the US put on tariffs. <laughs> so this, is, this sort of has, reminds me a little of the Dalek Art Company in the sense that they brought in technology from England to actually help dominate the market here. So that's sort of like the Jambier lathe and you know, sort of interesting parallels. Um, they originally did not, they, it was not until the late 1890s they started getting into becoming a sculpture foundry. But then they, at, at the end, in the 20s and 30s, they were working with all the biggest. Um, Dick has some, we'll get into this, Dick has some records from here. And Textron buying the company in 1967 is significant. So the archive. We found the archive, it's, been, it's at Brown University. Fred Roy Jr., I've, because I went down to see Shirley on Saturday, I now found, found out that Fred Roy Jr. is alive. I thought he's dead. So, well, I, actually because I called his, his uh, I, I called the wife of Sam Ho from Owl at the Bridge, and she gave me the scoop. Sam, unfortunately, has passed away. Um, Fred was a, the son of the senior VP, I think the original, one of the original VPs, uh, at least for the, um, I think the Sculpture Foundry. Um, there was a tremendous number of records. It was clear that whatever the records were in were more valuable than the records because it's been described to me they were just dumped out on the factory floor and just in a complete mess. They were dirty, they were not organized in any fashion. Um, Textron was going to finance the archiving and the cataloging. When they found out that the tax break they were expecting couldn't be realized because Brown Universities would still own the materials, they stopped it. And then they, they pulled up roots. They completed the tasks they were on. But basically, the only thing we've got out of it is a gross categorization and cleaner records. Um, I've not been able to get through to Brown in the last few years to find out what's happened. I don't think anything happened. I think, I think it's overwhelming the amount of materials they have, and I don't know this stuff. So. However, when we visit, when we, Dick and I went down there, Dick contracted Sam to come meet us. He was the only one that knew anything about what was in the archives. We sat down, we started going through them, and Dick started asking questions, I started asking questions. Dick focused on records that he wanted, which was the metal 
records, right? I focused on the products that may have used um, Render's design. The only one I found, you probably recognize that one up in the upper right, the bust of Lincoln. These I found too, but this sort of ties into why, so I didn't, I didn't detail this, but Victor, when Victor um, tried to contact Director Leach, uh, Director and Director, Director Leach left, he wanted him to know that he had worked with Gorham because I think in his world, everything is breaking down. It's like better to be honest now and save it. This is my opinion. I don't know. Uh, and I found these uh, Gettysburg address plaques. That's, that's what Brenner said that uh, Gorm wanted them for. These are made with pennies. So these products, because they're focused on Lincoln, probably didn't exist before the 1909 census. Now, were they planned beforehand? I don't know. These are all different dates. That's the thing I was really interested in is the dates on these. They're all different dates, 10, 12, 13. So it wasn't like they made the product catalog right then and there. Maybe this was something they did later. These are the things I want to know. Um, there are a number of designs out there based on Lincoln's de uh, design. Uh, Gorham apparently had a, probably a pretty good licensing agreement. I wonder if I wonder if Brenner gave away his rights. I don't know. Um, this plaque here, that's not that uncommon, I occasionally see on eBay, was very popular in schools, high schools and colleges. My former alma mater, I tried to negotiate buying one, and they finally sold on eBay for $2,500. Um, if you ever go to Littleton Coin up in Littleton, New Hampshire, when you walk in the lobby, there's a huge one of them up there on the wall. I'm not in the lobby, but in the offices upstairs. Uh, so, and if you want to own one, you can too. There's two on eBay from Wheelboy02. This one, these, I'm sorry, I can't really point. Um, these, these uh, the two photographs in the middle are from the same set, from the same uh, bouquet set. Uh, the, the one with the penny, the cent still in it is 1909. I want, to, I want to think that they saw the S mark on this 1909, they just had to separate it from the bouquet. I don't know. Um, he has two sets. So th th this one, is, the one on the right, has um, got a very nice uh, vertigree in it, if, you, if that's what you like. But it's more probably because it's intact. Um, the thing that Dick got were the Gorm records and the Brenner production work. So at some point, we don't know when, all of the records, dating from 1905 to 1920 had been transcribed because you could tell over the years it was the same exact handwriting, exact same pressure, no changes whatsoever. It wasn't done recently because I can tell it's done with a ink quill, a narrow one, maybe a, a modern one. Um, and we only found three instances of Brenner. That tells me, probably didn't do a lot of work with Gorm. I, I just don't think so. Because, you know, you can take a look at um, Dick's records. I don't know, I'd love to talk to Shirley about that, but it seems to me that if you look at the other artists, like I saw Borglum, I saw Frazier, I saw a lot of St. Gaudens, I saw a lot of contemporary artists. But maybe it's because they were primarily doing statues, not a lot of plaques. I know I haven't looked through all of them, but it just seems more and more like they wouldn't be the first to go to. They're the guy you want to sell the licensing rights to, or Disney, and that's going to really market the hell out of it. Okay, end of that chapter. The next chapter, and this is why, this is personal for me. This is why I feel a, a certain connection with David Brenner in many ways. This is the copyright redux. History has a way of repeating itself. So the copyright redux started with, the, my mind was full of Lincoln and all. So this is, I mentioned to you that I first contacted Dick because I wanted to put together a catalog resume um, on Brenner's work and I wanted to integrate his biography and do a lot of research on his family, et cetera, get to know them better, et cetera. Um, and as I said, that seemed to be 
without resources like the AMS at our disposal day to day, like that just seems to be impossible, at least in the short term. So instead, we talked about it and we realized, oh, geez, the bicentennial of Lincoln's birth and the centennial of Lincoln's sense is coming up. Dick had done in preparation for the um, 71 exhibit, um, had suggested to, um, geez, I don't remember who it was at the time. Sorry, I'm very tired. That they make a metal honoring Brenner. And he suggested, well, go work with presidential art medals because they do that type of commemorative, commemorative um, minting and they could take on the project and fund the cost. I don't want to necessarily fund it. But Dick did and that worked. So that was back in 1971. He said, well, let's do something similar. I know it's not specifically for Brenner, but we can make it about Brenner's because it was a design of Brenner's and we can sort of tie in the Lincoln Bicentennial and the Centennial together. So I thought that was a great idea and it was more collaborative than I'm suggesting, but, um, but Dick said, and, and, and one of the reasons why this is very attractive to us is Dick said, well, Medallic Art Company has the original Galvano design that came from the Brenner family. They're not gonna get any better fidelity than that probably. I mean, there's probably a lot of Galvanos out there, but this came through the Brenner family. It's probably, there aren't as many generations of reproduction in it. it there just can't be. So that's what we did. Um, we had Mako make the dies. I, and in order to sort of cement, and by the way, the intent of this metal was really to appeal to coin collectors and get them interested in metal. So, it wasn't meant to be a high art metal. That's not what we were shooting for. A commemorative metal that they would associate with, they would connect to in some way. And we thought combining Lincoln Bicentennial and this uh, Centennial Lincoln Cent would do that. Um, so we, but, but then we wanted to play, we played with the idea a little bit. So we wanted to make it, well, it's got the same, um, um, drawing a blank of the word, same sort of design features on the front and back as a Lincoln Cent. Um, we can show Brenner actually chasing, the, pretend it's, he's chasing the Lincoln die. I'm not sure that's what he's doing there in that original photograph. But, and then, so Dick came up with a lot of the concept. The only thing that I really, I can claim as my own is, are the weed ears. And then I think Don Eversart said, I've got to make this a little more creative. So he added the Lincoln. <laughs> now we wanted the biggest possible. We wanted a double sided. And at the time, the biggest press Medallic Art had was a 1250 ton hydraulic press. Um, it took 12 strikes, which means you've got to kneel it in between. Um, it's massive for a double struck metal. I'm sorry, for a double sided metal. Um, weighs about a quarter, one and a quarter pounds. It's pretty large. It's about a quarter size original packet. We really wanted it to be as big as possible, and this was the biggest Medallic Art felt they could do. Um, and that's probably why the press broke. <laughs> so halfway through striking, the press broke. Uh, we waited four months for the manufacturer in Germany to um, repair it. No, they didn't repair it. They ended up actually machining it in-house. Um, but, and we actually, it's got, there's a beautiful custom velvet back case to it. Um, so, we had made sure we were very careful. We wanted Everhart because he represented US Mint. Once again, we're trying to appeal to the, the, the um, metal collectors. Um, so Everhart had to get signed approval from the US Mint before the, doing the project. And what was interesting is he wasn't sure it was gonna happen because he thought, oh, they may not let me. Um, but I said, well, let me talk to lawyers. So I talked to them, we discussed it. I explained why this would not be confused because first of all, the US Mint doesn't make anything this big. Second of all, it's an existing copyrighted design that's already been in, been produced. Third, the back is copyrighted by um, Everhart. And by the way, he didn't put his initials on like they do with the Mint, he signed it. He wanted him to sign it. Um, so, Actually, we got approval from it. I've got emails showing this. The only condition they had is they wanted the marketing to say that it was not, we're not affiliated with the US Mint, which we did. 
So I won't go into all the delays. There's a lot of other delays, including the fact that apparently Mako didn't know how to do anything with finishing. They couldn't do a patina at all. Um, we ended up taking it to Greco Industries, and we're very happy with that. Um, but Bob did not want it to leave the shop. He said, nothing leaves Medallicart without my um, patina. It's part of our signature, just won't have it. And we stayed in that sort of uh, stalemate for quite a while until finally, I guess I withheld payment. And he said, okay, I'll ship him. He didn't give me a discount for not finishing it. I will say that. Um, so once, once the finishing started at Greco, we finally had a product. We, see, we just wanted to start marketing. We needed something to, that was finished to, to market. So once we did that, we could take photographs, we could do marketing. I sent the marketing text along with the uh, ad to legal. I didn't hear anything. And then Everett calls me and says, Treasury is concerned about the confusion that this is a US Mint product, despite the fact that we are marketing a show that have language indicating that. Um, then I get a call from Don about three weeks after that. He said, Treasury is very concerned. They want me to take my signature off the back to avoid confusion. I said, they're already been struck. They're being finished. I'll show you how that difficult that would, would have been. Um, so, Finally, I get an email from Treasury. So Treasury stepped in, because I've been dealing mainly with the, the Mint uh, lawyer. I won't say names here, but I know their names. But I'll never forget their names. Um, so I get an email from a guy I've never met, but Don has told me I may be contacted by him, saying that he's advised Everhart to remove his signature. And so I respond with an email that details everything, the sequence of events, the fact that we had an agreement, copyright, nah, 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 everything. I had no response, no response. They went dark. I never got another email from either one of them. I think they screwed up or they didn't know what to do. Um, my voicemails went unanswered, but I, at this point, I, I managed to get basically every phone number they're associated with, their office, their department, their home phone, their cell phone. I just started calling them. And I finally reached the Treasury Council. I thought, He's going to be at a DC party on Saturday night. I'm going to call him, and he's going to be drunk, and he won't look at his phone. And that's exactly what happened. And I, we had it. We, I was sort of went at it a little bit, but he realized that he was in the wrong, so he, he wasn't getting too aggressive. I was getting very aggressive. And I basically said, then sue us, because you're going to put us out of business. And if you make a big deal of this, Everhart, who is in line to be the chief engraver to the US Mint, may lose that. He won't ruin his career over this. Never heard from him again, and we just ignored him. So that scared us because we thought this is going to be difficult to fix. So this shows sort of the progression, the history, the timeline of this little story. There's just a few events that are important. Um, when Brenner copyrighted the Lincoln design, there was no copyright on the design itself. We didn't have a copyright. But Kleber, who I believe produced the first product, or maybe the US Mint, I'm not sure. It might have been a tie. Kleber has, if you, if you see on the right-hand side, it was copyright P.D. Brenner. You can see it here. I've, I've had to put in a lot of contrast to see it. It's, it's hard to see. Um, and then take a look at um, Don Everard's signature. You see how it's right along the bottom of that table? It, that would have been almost impossible to chase out. I remember contacting Hugo and he said, just, well, first of all, you're gonna have to refinish all the metals after you chase them anyway. So it's just gonna cost a lot of money. And he, was, he didn't seem to be willing to do it. So that just convinced me. So the next chapter, the cataloger. How am I doing on time, by the way? Okay, okay, so I had a lot of information here on Dick, and I think just because 
the immersion in the last two weeks. I knew I couldn't keep it together, so I took it out. So surely, sorry. <laughs> but this is very cool. This is a, a if I ever make a, a medal of uh, honoring Dick, I'm going to use this. This is from the, so this is Dick's, by the way, this is Dick's writing. This is his caption. Victor D. Brenner looks over the shoulder of Dick Johnson at an exhibition of the artist's work on the centennial of artist's birth in 1971. Johnson holds Brenner's original plaster models on loan from the Philadelphia Mint. And of course, they've got, they got the Gasparo ones as, uh, for the reverse as well. Um, here's some things from the Johnson archives. So this is just a description that Dick gave of the event. I didn't think I could do better. The idea wasn't to go into a lot of detail here. But something from the Johnson archives that might be of interest. These are the three-page memo that was sent to the um, curator, I'm sorry, the director of the Chase and Manhattan um, Museum, Bank, Bank Museum, and it's an inventory list from the three different institutions that gave medals. Why is it the ANS only gave one? Now, Dick helped organize this restriking of most of, the, uh, most of those medals because Medallic Art had a lot of the original material. I'm sure someone's going to give a report on that someday. The Klan. So, this is Victor's family, or at least his brothers and sister. I don't have a lot of information on Morse. Um, they may be, there may be some members watching right now. Uh, I've managed to contact Ariel Brenner. Ariel Brenner is the granddaughter of Samuel. I've also contacted Joe Brenner. He is the grand, I'm sorry, the nephew of Victor. I have not found any leads on Miriam's side of the family. What happened there? Okay, um, and none on Morris's side. But prior to this meeting, so in preparation for this meeting, I really sparked up my, all my email contacts to try to get more information. I was desperate. And in so doing, I contacted both Ariel and Joe, and they, they may be watching now. The ANS was gracious enough to allow them to participate for free, and since they couldn't make it in person, that was perfect. Um, so they were sent invitations. Um, is there, oh, I found out Ariel is online. Hello, Ariel. Did you like my inside joke? Um, so by going down to Shirley's house to look at the Gorham archives and also to hold that Lincoln bust, Shirley told me I'm gonna, what is gonna come down. And I, I, I said, I might come down. I may not have time to go to come down before the, um, the conference. She said, well, you might wanna come down. Guess what I found? Well, they have this huge, I shouldn't say huge, it's a shoe box. But it's huge because there's over a hundred items of correspondence between Miriam and Michael and they date over six decades from the late 90s, 1890s, to the early 1960s. Um, I only have this one photo. It's from a card that's uh, dated, I think, 1902. It's from Vienna. It's to Fanny, that was Miriam's nickname, from Michael. And I, it's just hilarious what it says on the back. So let me read it. Dear Fanny, had a bottle of the most excellent wine in this village then walked all night on to the next for my breakfast at a distance of 15 miles, where the wine was not as good, your Mike. Then, and sort of a PS, this was an inside joke to Ariel, because she told me it was very common for the family to write these sort of PSs at strange angles, so that's why I did it. Do write me a long letter, how I wish I, was, I were roaming in this fashion with you. PS, not exactly in this fashion. So, Michael Brenner. Uh, I didn't know a lot about Michael Brenner until I contacted Joe about six years ago, and he connected me with 
you know, Joseph, I, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his name, Jack Lessring. Anyway, Jack Lessring did, did a catalog resume on Michael Brenner. Michael is sort of a different artist than um, Victor. Um, and Jack Lessring's um, book, there's a section that says, we might note in passing the sculptor's lifelong distaste for the finishing and polishing he learned in his student days. Guess who trained him? Victor. <laughs> he developed instead a repertoire of surface treatment in keeping with early 20th century artist, artistic tenets. Um, so Michael, at once he once he, he did, didn't stay in New York very long. So uh, Victor did bring him over like he did with his parents. He didn't stay there very long. He actually went back to Paris at the advice of one of his teachers. And as far as I know, he never moved back. Um, while there, Bo, he, he, he did some, I guess he, his career followed a different path. And Victor's, it's almost unfair to compare the two because they were motivated by different aesthetics. I think. Um, and I'm not an expert on Michael Brenner. I, there's probably one on the, maybe one on the, uh, Team meeting now, the Zoom meeting now. Um, but he he seemed what I keep on hearing. Everyone say he keeps he kept that Michael Benner kept on returning to the beginning. So he kept on sort of trying to start over and remake what he made. I'm not sure I understand, but apparently he had he didn't he destroyed a lot of his work and not a lot of his extent compared to what he he produced. So this is just a few of them. Um, Jack Leisring, I was able to contact him this week and he gave me these high-risk photos. Uh, Gertrude Stein, Stein was apparently um, the raconteur along with uh, Michael. Um, there's Joseph himself from 1918. Um, the young man standing, I think, I, I picked that one because it, it's also in 1918. It sort of gives a, a feel for when about the, how his sculpture was probably different than Brenner's at the time. But isn't it interesting that, well, let me move on to the next. Isn't it interesting that Michael Brenner was moving, I don't know when this was, but he did a lot of metallic, I mean, metal making too, or plaque making. And uh, I wonder if their careers were sort of crossing. I don't know. Be interesting to find out. This is good, a good research project. So the, we're at the, on the last chapter. Hopefully I'll complete on time. Um, so I call to everyone to build the Brenner community, um, support these ANS Brenner projects, and help revitalize the COAC. Patrick Surgeon. I am amazed. A artist. A Rangers financial advisor. Thank you. Advice to help you. Oh, Brenner's in space. You need to get archives so that when they find this Main consent in space. They know how they got there. Thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.